Georgia's tight race for governor is getting national attention. Brian Kemp is not only the Republican gubernatorial nominee, he's Georgia's Secretary of State. Stacey Abrams looking to make history by becoming the nation's first female African-American governor. Volunteers are picking up phones and knocking on doors across the state. Come in and register to vote. We are very excited to register as many people as we possibly can. What do we want? Register to vote! When do we want it? Today! I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. Pull back that veneer. And you see something really rotten happening. It's almost like termites coming in. They're in the wood. They're eating the wood away. And you don't even realize your house is getting ready to collapse until it's almost too late. We have a historic decision today striking down a key part of the Voting Rights Act, a civil rights law passed back in 1965. The Supreme Court essentially said racism is over and these communities don't need to pre-clear these changes anymore. This decision leaves virtually unprotected minority voters in communities all over this country. We are witnessing a tidal wave of voter suppression around the country. If you look at Alabama, Arkansas, North Carolina, Ohio, Kansas, North Dakota, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Georgia, which is becoming ground zero. We've got to understand, this isn't a Klan cross burning. This stuff is very bureaucratic, it's very mundane, it's very routine, but it is lethal. For spacious skies, for amber waves of grain. Mountain majesty above the fruited plain. My name is Bobby Jenkins. I live in Cuthbert, Georgia. Uh, the county is Randolph County. Uh, I spent about 30, what, almost 35 years in education. My superintendent of schools. My name is Loretta Brown. I live in Morgan, Georgia, and I grew up in Randolph County. I am the state advisor for the Georgia NAACP Youth and College Division. My name is Lewis Brooks. I live in Thomason, Georgia, of some county. And I've been living here my whole 89 years, except the two years I spent in service in Korea. In 19, I believe it was 55 or 56, that's when they started to let black people vote in Upson County. When I went to raise the vote, it was tough. They asked me all kind of questions to try to keep me from registering. I passed the test. Once I got my voter right, I decided I wasn't going to let anything stop me from voting. Because I used to walk. You go up the street here. Across the next street over there, I walk over there and walk back and go. And I didn't miss the voting, except when they closed the poll. I'm, I'm a citizen. It's my right to vote and speak my opinion. I saw this ad saying that there was a proposal to close seven of the nine the precincts in Randolph County. I said, what? Then they put it in the papers that they was closing, both costing too much money. First of all, Randolph is a poor county. Just to give you an example of what it would mean, there's a community of benevolence a little north of town. Uh, had that precinct been closed, some of those individuals would have to go 30 miles round trip in order to vote. It would have been a terrible hardship on our poor, on our elderly, and on those who are least able to afford uh, transportation. You no, know, I got disabled and I couldn't do no driving. I know I couldn't afford to go that far to vote. This was on a black neighborhood. It made me feel like they were closing down to keep the black people from voting, because most black people vote Democrat. They own the clothes in one white voting place. Everybody from my hand to black had to go clean over there to the white section to vote. We're human, and we have our rights to vote just like anybody else. 
Voters in Randolph County, Georgia are outraged. Randolph County residents expressed their concerns with the Board of Elections. Our citizens turned out in full force. They were behind us 100% trying to keep those polling places open. Convenience of the voter. You all are not considering that at all. There's no disenfranchisement for the African Americans. I went to the meeting, find out that they were trying to close seven of the precincts. You got to stand up. You cannot allow this to continue. They gave a couple of reasons, saying it would save money. The other one was that uh, several of the polling places were not ADA compliant. The, the thing that was so ironic is we voted that way in May. You know, they weren't any worse in November than they were in May. It will be impossible for rural voters without vehicles to vote on election day. It will be impossible for them. They will have to walk three and a half hours just to get from one of these polling places to Cuthbert and Shellman. We did petition to keep it open. Pressure from the residents, civil rights organization, speaking up, speaking out. Uh, they called the meeting to order and uh, they only had one motion. They voted to keep them open. The news of what was happening here in Randolph County went worldwide. The incident that we experienced threw the spotlight on everything else that had been going on. You know, we find out that in the state of Georgia, there were two over 200 other polling places had been closed. If you move a poll four miles, it is the equivalent of a 20% drop in black voter turnout. That's what shutting down these polls mean. With two months to go, the race is heating up in Georgia. Stacey Abrams' campaign feel they have the momentum behind them, and many of the posts we've seen so far support that. You know, the Democrats are working hard, registering all these minority voters, and if they can do that, they can win these elections in November. There's no law in Georgia that requires the Secretary of State to process voter registration forms on a particular timeline. Kemp withheld putting the names of thousands on the voter registration list until after the election. 80% were African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans. Keep your eyes on the prize. This is Fulton County. Linda Marshall is my name. Most of my professional career has been in public service of one kind or another as a teacher, as a government worker. I moved here in August of this year, but because of my emphasis on always being registered <laughs> and always having the ability to vote, I did that almost immediately when I got here. Of course, I also knew the importance of the upcoming election, and I wanted to be a part of that history. Keep your eyes on it got closer and closer and closer to the election, and I was getting a little bit concerned, so I called the Secretary of State's office. My name is not on the roll. They can't tell me where it is. So all of that paperwork that I sent in, I don't know where it is. I'm 65, and for the first time, I did not get a chance to vote in a very close election of historic importance and proportion. Welcome to Georgia. Hold on.
The midterm election in Georgia is only 29 days away. Civil rights leaders say Kemp is illegally removing people from Georgia's voters list. Republican Brian Kemp has already gotten the backing of our current president. Thousands of purged from Georgia's voting rolls. Purged from Georgia's voting rolls. 890,000. No idea they could vote. over who's been removed from voting There has been instance after instance of unlawful voter purging. States are removing voters, uh, many of whom have actually been found to have been eligible but were unlawfully removed from the rolls. I received the purge notice. So I open it up and I read the first sentence. Now I, along with 380,000 Georgians, received the same notice. That's an especially pernicious way to prevent people from voting because once you register to vote, you would think that you should be able to remain on the rolls. And once you're removed from the rolls, you cannot vote. I went out and got the mail and there were two letters in there. They looked official. You're hereby notified that the city of Thunderbolt has challenged your right to vote. The city of Thunderbolt states that you no longer reside within the municipality. My license is valid, my address is valid, I own this home. Why are you questioning my right to vote? You know, the purges, they've been going on for decades, maybe over a century in this state. If you haven't voted in the last few elections, They'll purge you, as if you must not be in the state anymore. If you move within the same county, they'll purge you, assuming you're not living in Georgia anymore. If you don't return a postcard from the Secretary of State, they'll purge you, because to them it means you're not a resident at this address. All of these tactics, specifically and disproportionately, target people of color, poor people, the elderly, all of whom tend to vote for Democrats. Brian Kemp is notorious for erasing the polls and purging people right before the election deadline. You have a candidate at the top of the ticket who is responsible for maintaining the integrity of the election. He needed to have his hands on the levers. You have a, an umpire who is also playing in the game. Less than 20 days away from the midterms now. The race for Georgia's governorship is a toss-up. Literally is a dead heat. This governor's race is already won for the history books, but it's also seeing record numbers of requests for absentee ballots, especially from African-American voters. At a time where we're seeing roughly almost half of the people who've turned in an absentee ballot are people of color, that's a really, really good sign for Stacey Abrams. We caught them off guard by running such a large-scale program and mailed 1.6 million African Americans an absentee ballot application. In this midterm election, the absentee ballot requests are even outperforming presidential years. So that is, that is startling and eye-popping and something that we need to dig in on to see what's going on there. My name is Norman Broderick, and I'm in Potter Springs, Georgia, Cobb County. I have did 24 years in the military, deployed to Iraq twice, Bosnia, Saudi Arabia. I voted absentee before when I was deployed. When I was in Iraq the first time, I voted absentee, and when I was in Iraq the second time, I voted absentee. The absentee ballot is a very important tool that exists to allow people, not only just the military, but anybody who happens to be away from their voting station to be able to cast a vote. My name is Peggy Hsu. Uh, I'm from Johns Creek, Georgia. 
I left Georgia for DC in the beginning of October, and before I left, I mailed out my absentee ballot application so that our registrar would send an absentee ballot to my new DC address. I work at a U.S. Army Central, which is located at Shaw Air Force Base in Sumter, South Carolina. I'm away from home during the week. I knew I wasn't going to be able to get back to Georgia to vote. I could only do this absentee. I filled out everything I was supposed to fill out. I sent their documents in. I got confirmation that it was received. And to my surprise, I did not receive my absentee ballot. I checked my mailbox every day. It was like nearing the end of the month. Um, and so I started calling the voter protection hotline. I called my registrar. I sent emails. And it was really, really getting close to the election date. And I just, I never received my ballot the election day came and went, and I wasn't able to vote in the end. When I contacted my wife and asked her about it, um, I think it was a couple of days before the election, it came here. And I tried contacting the Georgia Elections Board. I was told they did receive my absentee ballot request. Everything was filled out correctly but that they mailed it to the wrong address. And she admit that yes, they did mess up. It was their fault. But there was nothing I could do about it. It's too late. It's over with. And my vote will not be counted during this election. It was probably one of the most frustrating things I've ever experienced. After having spent, you know, my entire college career very invested in the political process, it was, I don't know, like a punch to the gut. It still pisses me off to this day. Being in Baghdad, voting, absentee, was easier than being four hours away trying to vote absentee in South Carolina. I took to Facebook and like the millennial activist that I am, I recounted my experience in a Facebook post. I wrote, this is what happened. I wasn't able to vote and if you had a similar experience, let me know. And my friend from high school, she reached out to me and she said, I also had struggles trying to get my ballot in, voting absentee. So I submitted an absentee ballot it came two days right before election day. Over the course of 48 hours, we had 40 people. So many people in our immediate Facebook circle knew somebody who had a similar experience to us. People have requested it like far in advance. Some people just didn't get their vote in. So that was when we really realized that this was not an isolated incident. It was a much bigger issue and a much more deeper rooted sort of phenomenon that was going on statewide. I did speak with the Board of Elections and he just dismissed it as like a hiccup and he's like, oh, like, no, you don't really know what you're talking about. 40 case is not really a hiccup. It's more of like a wake up call. Today we've worked to get answers about the claim that thousands of voters never got the absentee ballots they requested. Election day. The race between Abrams and Kemp is literally neck and neck. Their fate is now in the hands of voters. The day is finally upon us. The midterm elections are happening. Voters head to the polls in one of the most intensely fought midterm elections. The race for Georgia's governorship is a toss-up. I live in the South. I'm always worried about election day. Have a great morning and go vote. Oh yeah, go, go vote today. Voting started here in Georgia this morning, and if you think getting the polls early will keep you from getting stuck on long lines, think again. Voter Protection Hotline, how can I help you? Voter Protection Hotline, how can I help you? I've never seen the line. The line hasn't moved in over an hour. The line is running out. The I really thought I was going to be able to run in and run out like I usually do. The first thing I saw was just people everywhere. So we stood there for a while without moving. And then we would inch up. And then we wouldn't move. We had a lot of people with children there, pregnant mothers, elderly people. Some people have medical issues. I took my son to school that morning. And then I went to vote at Ferguson Elementary, where I vote every election. The line was so long through the school and wrapped around the building. The lines was crazy everywhere, all over the county. It was real long. I was in line for two hours. 
And I got to the door. That's when they was checking your ID before you go in. And she couldn't find my name. She directed me to go downtown Gwinnett. And I was like, I'm not going to vote. And it was this older lady. She came over and she like held my hand and was like, please go do it. We need this. And I looked in her eyes and said, I will. About eight or nine, we started getting the calls about the long lines. Mm -hmm. Long lines at the polling stations lead to low voter turnout. The research is just crystal clear on that. Everyone in the world knew we were going to vote today. And in my neighborhood, there are no power cords. All these dedicated people waiting to vote. This is what we call voter suppression. People are like upset and angry. I started calling the Secretary of State's office. I was either hung up on, placed on hold. They want people to go home and not vote. I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to be right here. The reason they sent me from Ferguson to the downtown Gwinnett was for the provisional vote. So I drove 25 minutes, and then when I got there, it was crowded in there. I waited 45 minutes to find out that's not where I needed to be. She told me that this was the wrong place and that I can go back to Ferguson. I had to call back and redo my schedule. So now the voting not only cut on my time, cut on my money. When we went in, filled out all the paperwork, had the ID, took it up to the lady. I had mine in my hand. One hand had hers in the other, because mm -hmm. she's legally blind. So we go give it to the lady, and she goes to scan Barbara's ID. Wow. So she looked up at Barbara. She said, well, Miss Barbara, when was the last time you voted? <laughs> My sister got strong. I've been <laughs> voting since really. I was 18 years old, <laughs> and I'm 82. Yeah, I was disappointed. She was a little upset. Um, My girl wanted well, to vote, and they were trying to yeah. keep her from voting. Since I became a citizen, I have not missed an election. I showed up and a very nice lady, she looked at my ID and said, no, you're not registered. And I said, no, no, wait a second. Here's my registration card and showed them that I was registered. And they said, yeah, but your name is Del Rio with a space, but your voter ID says Del Rio one word and therefore it doesn't match. In the voter registration, my name shows as Del Rio with a space. My ID is Del Rio no space. That was a non-match. I said, this is not legal and I need to be allowed to vote. After much discussion, they said to me, this time we'll allow you to vote, but it's a little bit like they're doing me a favor. The right to vote should be something that we should make easier rather than more difficult. Latinos and Asian Americans are six times more likely than white Georgians to be cut from the voter rolls because of exact match. And black Americans are eight times more likely to be cut because of exact match. I have voted in every election, now all of a sudden I'm not there. Controversy surrounds the state's exact match law that put the registrations of 53,000 voters, most of them African Americans, on hold because of discrepancies in the way their names are spelled in state databases. People of color have names that are a little bit less uh, typical, and that's where the errors are at their highest. Brian Kemp knows this. A group of students will not have their voices heard at the polls, at least not in Georgia. They're turning a bunch of students away over here. We're showing up here and at the Booker T. Washington location, um, and their names were not on the actual roll. The students were being turned away. I talked to over 50 students that morning. First, they told me I was at the wrong polling station. They said, You're, uh, you didn't get registered. I was like, what do you mean? And there was only about like, what, four voting ballot booths? They didn't process my registration. My registration didn't go through. I walked back to my door and said, you know, I guess I just won't vote. Just before I went to vote, I had been in an African-American history class where we were actually talking about voter suppression, you know, about what was it like for people that were going to vote. I filled out a little slip of paper, gave it to the poll workers. They looked up at me and they said, it's coming up in our system as though you're not a citizen of the United States. I just sort of looked at them like they had two heads. Like, I'm sorry, I was born in New York, what? 
When I got to the front of the line, they informed me that I was registered to vote, but not in Doherty County. They were telling me that I was registered back home in Winter Robins, where I was from, and I've never voted there. I've never even been registered there. The thing was that I had brought proof that I was a U.S. citizen. I had with me my driver's license, my passport card, and my Emory student ID, but they would not look at the passport card whatsoever to prove that I was a citizen. I walked out crying. What I learned in history class just hours before, this happened to me in 2018. I had been through and it participated in its voter registration drive on campus within a community. It was just like, wow, after all of this, I'm not going to be able to vote myself. Like when I was growing up, voting was a thing. It was an event. It's a little me is trailing behind my parents watching them vote. My parents would take me to the voting polls every time when I was little. I would go in and I would help them fill out the bubbles. I get a chance to vote and then you get there and the experience is just terrible and you have to call your mom and be like, why is this so hard? You never told me it would be this hard. This was huge for us because Stacey Abrams was actually a Spelman alum. History would have been made and it would have been made by my Spelman sister. If there is no one who gets to 50% tonight, Robin, there will be a runoff in December. We'll find out as the day and evening goes on. Voter Protection Hotline, how can I help you? Are they letting you know? Are you really kidding me? Old people who can't vote, there's young people who can't vote, there's people in every county who can't vote. It just created this intense fog of confusion across the state. Been here for three hours, four or five hour wait. Five hours. This is way, way too long for us to stay uh, and vote. How long have you waited in line here? About three and a half hours. And have you decided you can't stand it? You can't take it anymore? Are you going to go home? I'm, I'm hurting. I, I'll be back. i got to go take some medicine. It was really good. Uh, the lines weren't too long and everyone was super helpful. We don't hardly ever have to wait here. It's always a pleasant experience up here. If you have a fixed resource, an easy way to suppress the vote is to just make that resource unavailable to the people who you don't want to vote. And that's exactly what happened in the 2018 election here in, in the state of Georgia. In places like North Fulton County, which are wealthy, there were more machines than anyone could ever use. In black neighborhoods, there were a quarter of the number of machines that were needed to service the population. Lots of people left without voting. It was people just dropping off when it became two hours, three hours, fourth hour is very heartbreaking. All it takes is a little walking away at 159 counties to influence an election. A little here, a little there, and then in a race like this, which was so close, there you go. All night on Twitter, a trending topic, hashtag stay in line. I had to go and pick my son up. He had to be picked up before six. I picked my son up and he went with me and sat in the car. And then I went back to Ferguson Elementary. And by this time, the evening crowd is there and the line has tripled. And I was like, oh, there is no way. Just for my one vote, it took me like six hours. And I wanted to give them because I promised that elderly lady outside that I would do it. Five hours, so about five hours, took me to vote. It sucks the life out of you. I'd been in people's homes, I'd been in their neighborhoods, I'd held their hands. And so to get to election night, and to start hearing more and more stories of voter suppression, to hear more and more from people who were told that they couldn't vote or who were turned away or had to give up because of four hour lines. That broke my heart.
Republican Brian Kemp holds a narrow lead over Democrat Stacey Abrams. The tens of thousands of ballots left to be counted in this election. They were counting provisional ballots for hours. Provisional ballots are basically placebos. They're being given to voters to kind of um, shut them up, make them go away. The next day, I was so excited because they were saying that it was a close race. I was like, oh, let me make sure that my vote count. So I called there the number that was on the paper that I got from the voting poll. And she go, oh no, they counting every vote. You don't need to call. I called my mom to double check. My mom worked for the poll for 20 some years. And she said, no, that's not true. You call back to make sure the vote count. And someone else said to the phone, and I got the same thing. No, you don't need to call back. We counting all the votes. We just started discovering so many people voting provisionally. We realized, oh, you voted provisionally, so you might have to come back here the next day and show your ID. Is that something you know? And they're like, no, no, I already voted. Like, I'm, I'm good. But you have to come back within three days with the documentation to prove you are who you say you are. When you have a large working class population that has to punch a clock, that's really tough. You've lost pay from work trying to vote. That's a poll tax. I wanted to confirm if my vote was counted or not. All right, what is your last name? Kimball. Let's see, there was no participation. Um, so does so that- You weren't given credit for voting. My vote was not counted. It looks like it on the election that yes, ma'am. Uh, no, I thank you, goodbye. Last night, my opponent ended her campaign. The election is over, and I'm honored to be Georgia's governor-elect. I acknowledge that former Secretary of State Brian Kemp will be certified as the victor in the 2018 gubernatorial election. But to watch an elected official baldly pin his hopes for election on the suppression of the people's democratic right to vote has been appalling. This is not a speech of concession. Because concession means to acknowledge an action is right, true, or proper. As a woman of conscience and faith, I cannot concede that. This is systematic. If you look at what has happened across this country in the last five years, 40 states have passed some kind of law to make it more difficult for people to vote. In Arkansas, the Supreme Court upheld a measure requiring voters to show photo ID. North Carolina with a targeted African American. Mm -hmm. Alabama, the governor was shutting down DMVs. In Ohio. Kansas, tens of thousands of people were prevented from voting. Texas allows a concealed gun license to vote, but will not include college IDs. Indiana, they purge 500,000 voters. Wisconsin, where a recent photo ID law may have handed the 2016 election to Donald Trump. We lost 41,000 voters. I think it changed the outcome of the election in the state of Wisconsin. America. We are not going to let them take from us what our grandparents and parents fought and suffered and died to give us in the first place. We are here to resist an ID law that is undemocratic, unconstitutional, and immoral. People are demanding democracy. In Washington, there's a new Native American Voting Rights Act. New Mexico now has same-day voter registration. Colorado, Nevada, Florida, and Arizona all passed laws restoring voting rights to those formerly incarcerated. Indiana blocked a law that would have allowed purging. New York activism led to an expansive package of voting reform. Michigan, a ballot initiative to end extreme partisan gerrymandering. And there's national legislation now to restore the Voting Rights Act. These efforts are being fought in the streets. They are being fought in the city councils. They are being fought in the state legislators. We belong together. We are all part of the fabric of this country, and we understand what's at stake. 
any voter suppression law is not just about black people. It is about America itself. On my mother's dying bed at 92 years old, former sharecropper, her last words were, do not let them take our votes away from us. We have the power to change this. We are going to vote you out so that we really do have fair and free elections.